Tonight's lecture is the 2010-2011 Joint School Board Lecture. It was created in a joint effort with the Gray Bruce Catholic District School Board, the Brantford Norfolk Catholic District School Board, and the Waterloo Catholic District School Board. St. Jerome's considers itself a partner in education with the Catholic School Boards of the Diocese of Hamilton and celebrates this partnership with this lecture. So let me introduce you to tonight's speaker, Mr. Robert Ellsberg. Robert Ellsberg is the editor in chief of Orbis Books, the publishing arm of the Marino Fathers and Brothers. He was a member of the Catholic worker community in New York, in New York City in the 1970s and served for two years as the uh, managing editor of the Catholic Worker. He has edited a number of works on Dorothy Day, including Dorothy Day, Selected Writings, published in 2005, The Duty of Delight, The Diaries of Dorothy Day, published in 2008, and the recently published All the Way to Heaven, The Selected Letters of Dorothy Day, published in 2010. Please join me in welcoming Rock Robert Ellsberg to St. Jerome's University. Over 75 years ago, on May 1st, 1933, at a communist rally in Union Square in New York City, Dorothy Day and a small troop of followers distributed the first issue of the Catholic Worker newspaper. She described its purpose in her first editorial, which was written along with the rest of the paper on her kitchen table. For those who are sitting on park benches in the warm spring sunlight, for those who are huddling in shelters trying to escape the rain, for those who are walking the streets in the all but futile search for work, for those who think that there is no hope for the future, no recognition of their plight, this little paper is addressed. It is printed to call their attention to the fact that, there are, that the Catholic Church has a social program to let them know that there are men of God who are working not only for their spiritual but for their material welfare. She had not sought no permission or authorization from the hierarchy before launching this paper. She had no clerical advisor or board of directors. She herself was a convert of only six years, an unwed single mother with fairly limited Catholic contacts and no theological education beyond her reading of the lives of the saints. And yet, in the midst of the Depression, she perceived the need for a new Catholic voice, one that would relate the gospel to the plight of the poor and the struggle for social justice. And she undertook of her own initiative to provide that voice. By the time of her death, nearly 50 years ago, this November, this, this month, Dorothy Day was widely regarded as the radical conscience of the American Catholic Church, but it was not always so. For most of her life, she was a fairly marginal figure, far outside the mainstream, operating without any official support or recognition from the church hierarchy, unfamiliar to most readers of the Catholic press. As a convert to Catholicism, she remained quite traditional in her religious practice. She attended Mass each day. As a Benedictine oblate, she prayed from a breviary, and she was never without her rosary. Steeped in the lives of the saints, her everyday speech and writing were filled with references to figures like St. Augustine, St. Francis of Assisi, or Teresa of Avila. And yet there was something quite different about her, different from almost anyone who came before, because she consciously combined her traditional faith with a radical approach to social and political issues. This was a conjunction of attitudes that didn't really exist before Dorothy Day came along. Together with other radicals, she marched in demonstrations, walked on picket lines, and was regularly arrested for acts of civil disobedience, the last time when she was 75. Like many of the saints she revered, she spent her life in active service to the poor. But she didn't stop with charity and the works of mercy. She joined the practice of charity with a passion for social justice. She believed it was not enough to feed the poor, but we must ask why they are poor. We must analyze and expose and resist those structures and institutional forces that give rise to poverty and the need for so much charity. At the same time, she was different from the type of radical who specializes merely in denouncing the world as it is. 
like a true prophet. She combined denunciation of the world's injustice with annunciation of a new world, of forgiveness, solidarity, and compassion. And she bore witness to the possibility of that world in her daily living. She believed the modern world was in need of a new kind of saint who could combine the dimensions of body and spirit, the historical and the transcendent, the political and the mystical, this world and the next. We couldn't get to heaven just merely worrying about our own souls. God would always ask us, what about the others? The Catholic Worker was the name of her newspaper, which sells today as it did 77 years ago for a penny a copy. The Catholic Worker is also the name of a lay Catholic movement that has attempted to show how the radical gospel commandment of love can be lived. G.K. Chesterton once said that Christianity has not been tried and failed. It has been found difficult and not tried. Dorothy Day was someone who set out to disprove that statement. No one who met her could claim that Christianity had not been tried. As a result, some people called her a communist. That was criticism that didn't bother her very much. She liked to say it was the complacency of Christians in her youth that had made her love the communists, and it was the communists in turn with their love of the poor who had led her to Christ. For his part, J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, said of her, Dorothy Day is a very erratic and irresponsible person. She is engaged in activities which strongly suggest that she is consciously or unconsciously being used by communist groups. From past experience with her, it is obvious she maintains a very hostile and belligerent attitude toward the Bureau and makes every effort to castigate the FBI whenever she feels so inclined. This was in her voluminous FBI file, which I obtained in under the Freedom of Information Act. And when I, I read that aloud to her, she was pretty uh, tickled, actually, and said, uh, it makes me sound like a mean old woman. <laughs> On the other hand, many people called her a saint, which was another matter. When they call you a saint, she used to say, it means basically you're not to be taken seriously. To be called a saint, she feared, was a way of being dismissed. Well, Dorothy can do that. She's She's a saint, which implied that what would have been difficult decisions for us must have come easily for her. No one knew, as well as she, how much she had paid for her vocation. As she wrote, neither revolutions nor faith is one without keen suffering. For me, Christ was not to be bought for 30 pieces of silver, but with my heart's blood. And yet today the church has initiated the cause for her canonization, a cause that I have supported believing that she embodied the type of holiness so necessary for our time, a holiness that is not concerned with its own purity or perfection, but empties itself to confront the burning issues of our time, poverty, violence, the desecration of nature, the meaning of work, the yearning for freedom and peace. <clears throat> Dorothy Day was born in Brooklyn 113 years ago, on November 8, 1897. She grew up in Chicago. Her father was a newspaper man, actually a sports writer. Although she was brought up in a nominally Christian home, from an early age she'd grown disillusioned by the failure of Christians as she saw to do anything to change the world. In her autobiography, there is a significant passage where she describes her first childhood encounters with the lives of the saints. She recalls how her heart was stirred by the stories of their charity toward the sick, the maimed, the leper. But there was another question in my mind, she notes. Why was so much done in remedying the evil instead of avoiding it in the first place? Where were the saints to try to change the social order, not just to minister to the slaves, but to do away with slavery? After dropping out of college, she moved to New York where she spent her youth working on various radical journals and lending her efforts to the struggle for a new social order. Her friends included anarchists, communists, anti-war activists, and assorted literary bohemians, including the playwright Eugene O'Neill. She was arrested a couple of times, in one case for picketing in front of the White House on behalf of women's suffrage. Despite the excitement of this type of engagement, Dorothy's early life was also marked by loneliness and a kind of moral and spiritual confusion. There was always in Dorothy Day a yearning for the transcendent that distinguished her from her companions. One of them later remarked that she was too religious to make a communist. The turning point in her life began some years later. She was living 
on Staten Island with a man named Forster Batterham, whom she de deeply loved. He was an agnostic with anarchist sympathies and a great lover of nature. And he helped awaken in Dorothy, who was basically a city girl, a greater appreciation for natural beauty and the miracle of creation. Dorothy called this time in her life a period of natural happiness. I was happy, but my very happiness made me know that there was a greater happiness to be obtained from life than any I had ever known. I began to think, to weigh things more, and it was at this time that I began consciously to pray more. It was also at this time that Dorothy discovered she was pregnant, an event fraught with significance for her. An earlier tragic love affair had ended in her having an abortion. For some time she believed she couldn't have children. Now in her pregnancy she experienced such joy and an impulse of gratitude so large that it could only be directed to God. Before long she found herself wishing to have her child baptized in the Catholic Church, a step she would follow, though it meant a wrenching separation from Forster who would have nothing to do with marriage. It also seemed initially to involve a painful rejection of the working class. She believed the Catholic Church was the church of the poor. As her father put it, it was the church of Irish cops and washerwomen. But to her radical friends, and sadly to herself as well, it seemed more like a friend of the rich, the ultimate defender of the status quo. She was literally at a loss about how to reconcile her faith and her loyalty to the cause of the oppressed. After her baptism in 1927, she spent the next five years in a kind of wilderness praying to find some way of reconciling her two loves. The answer came in December 1932 with her introduction to Peter Morin, an itinerant French philosopher who had actually first immigrated here to, to Canada before settling in the States, who simply showed up one day at her, at her apartment door. Peter Morin was 20 years older than Dorothy and frankly something of a, a character. Although he was accustomed to hard manual labor, he had lived almost entirely in the realm of ideas. Those who gave him the time of day and were willing to overlook his shabby appearance and his thick accent might recognize his genius and holiness. But even Dorothy later had to ask herself whether she really liked him. Nevertheless, the meeting between Dorothy Day and Peter Moran is surely one of the fateful moments in American Catholic history. The country at this time was in the throes of the Depression. Peter Morin believed the problems with the world were not ultimately economic or political, but spiritual. They came from making the bank account rather than the Sermon on the Mount the center of all values. As a result, Christians did not recognize Christ in their neighbors. The Catholic Church, he believed, had a radical message, a message of dynamite, but most church authorities preferred to seal it up. His aim was to blow the dynamite. That would get him on the FBI watch list today, I think. Dorothy immediately seized on the pra practical aspects of Peter's vision, and she set out to start a newspaper to propagate the social implications of the gospel. This was followed shortly by a house of hospitality, a center for practicing the works of mercy, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, clothing the naked. Not in the matter of an impersonal social agency, but in a spirit of personal responsibility. It's clearly not a solution to the vast problems of the Depression, but it showed a determination to put ideals into action. And so the Catholic Worker was launched on May 1st, 1933. Before meeting Peter Morin, Dorothy had prayed to find some way of achieving what she called a synthesis, reconciling body and soul, this world and the next. She was right to be confounded about which way to turn. None of the existing options reflected her particular sense of vocation, so she essentially invented her own way. Dorothy always gave credit to Peter Morin for supplying the ideas behind the Catholic worker. He provided her with a Catholic view of history and a personalist philosophy to replace the class struggle approach of her radical past. Before meeting Peter Dorothy Day, however, Peter seems to have been singularly incapable of translating his ideas onto a scale larger than himself. I think one of his major contributions was simply to give Dorothy a kind of permission to launch her own movement. Drawing on the lives of the saints, he showed that it was not necessary to wait for someone to authorize or sponsor the way of discipleship. The saints began immediately with whatever means were at hand, and if God 
blessed their venture, the means would arrive. For Dorothy, this meant starting a newspaper with no money, calling it the Catholic worker without seeking prior permission from the bishop or any other authority, daring to offer a Catholic perspective on social issues of the day that was far in advance of contemporary social teaching. At that time, what was called Catholic action was defined as participation of the laity in the apostolate of the bishops. But the Catholic worker was something completely new, a religious community of lay people organized under no rule with no formal accountability to religious authorities, determined to live out their faith in response to the so urgent social needs of the day. Certainly many people, both conservatives and liberals, were confounded by Day's ability to integrate a very traditional style of Catholic piety with a radical style of social engagement. But there was no paradox in her eyes. Her life was simply rooted in a sense of the radical implications of the Incarnation, the central doctrine of Christianity, the fact that God had entered our flesh in our history, and so what we did for our neighbors, we did directly for him. It was ultimately the Incarnation itself that showed the way toward that synthesis she had been seeking, the key to reconciling the spiritual and the material, the love of God and the love of neighbor, body and soul, this world and the next. This strong incarnational faith was the thread that united the various aspects of her life, her embrace of voluntary poverty and a life in community among the poor, her practice of the works of mercy, her prayer and commitment to the sacramental life of the church, her staunch commitment to social justice, her seamless garment approach to the protection of life, and her commitment to gospel nonviolence. Because of the incarnation, God had left the imprint of divinity all around us. All life was hallowed. God was present in our neighbors, especially in the disguise of those in need. This was the meaning of that famous passage in the Gospel of Matthew that was kind of the motto of the Catholic worker. I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. What you did for the least of my brethren, you did for me. This meant we didn't have to worry about what we would have done for Christ if we had lived 2,000 years ago. Whatever we should have done then, we could do now. She believed in the real presence of Christ in the consecrated bread and wine on the altar, but she believed that Christ was equally present in the poor. And so our response to the poor was a test of the authenticity of our worship. For how could we love God whom we haven't seen if we haven't loved our neighbor whom we have seen? And how could we love our neighbor who is hungry except by feeding him or her? The mystery of the poor is this, she said, that they are Jesus, and what you do for them, you do to him. And so the doctrine of the Incarnation had concrete social implications, but not just in her response to poverty, but in a more controversial way in her response to war. If Christ was present in the disguise of our neighbor, this was also true in his most terrible disguise, in the face of the one who is called our enemy. It was Dorothy's conviction that Jesus had come to offer a radical new definition of love as the ultimate law of our lives. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. It was a new commandment for the love exemplified on the cross extended beyond friends and those who were lovable, and those who were on our side. Jesus had left us a definition of nonviolence not only in his words but in the manner of his life and by his death and resurrection he had converted the cross, a sign of defeat and death, into a symbol of life and hope. And he had come to substitute the cross for the sword or the bomb as an effective instrument of liberation and justice. Dorothy Day's pacifist convictions were first tested during the Spanish Civil War, a war many if not most Catholics regarded as a crusade in defense of the church. Her response was grounded in the Gospels. The fact that when Christ himself was threatened with death, he told his disciples to put away their swords. This stance enough was, was enough to brand her as a marginal figure in the eyes of most American Catholics and subscriptions to the Catholic worker plummeted. The movement was more dramatically divided when she maintained her pacifist position throughout World War II. After Pearl Harbor, many of her closest supporters parted ways, subscriptions dropped even further, many houses closed. But even here, in the case 
of an apparently just cause, she rooted her stand in the gospel. If we could take liberties with Christ's relentless insistence on the way of love, how could we claim to base clear doctrine or moral theology on any other of his hard teachings? The way of the gospel was true folly in the eyes of the world, but we were not told to love up to the point of reason or prudence or personal safety, but to love unreasonably, foolishly, profligately, unto the cross, unto death. By the end of the war, in battling evil, the Allies thought nothing of devastating whole cities from the air. In Tokyo alone, 100,000 people were burned to death. And finally, there was the dropping of the atomic bombs, a weapon that foreshadowed the possible destruction of all human life. In the era of nuclear weapons, she believed, the teaching of indiscriminate love had become a practical necessity, an imperative. To live under the canopy of such weapons without resisting or raising an outcry was, in her view, to participate in the ultimate blasphemy. Over the years, the Catholic worker sponsored numerous protests against the dangers of nuclear war for her own refusal to cooperate with New York City's annual compulsory civil defense drills in the 1950s. She was regularly sentenced to jail. She didn't expect great things to happen overnight. She knew the slow pace by which change and new life comes. It was in a phrase she repeated often, by little and by little that we are saved. And yet she acted out of deep faith in the mystical bonds of cause and effect in which we are all connected. Any act of love might contribute to the balance of love in the world. Any suffering endured in love might ease the burden of others. We could only make use of the little things we possessed, the little faith, the little strength, the little courage. These were the loaves and fishes, and we could only offer what we had and pray that God would make an increase. I met Dorothy Day 35 years ago in 1975. I had taken a leave from college after my sophomore year and made my way to the Catholic Worker, hoping to learn something about life directly apart from books. And I planned to stay only a few months, but I was eventually hooked and ended up staying five years, which turned out to be the last five years of Dorothy's life. Our first meeting took place in the dining room of St. Joseph's house on East First Street. Dorothy took pride in the occasions when she was mistaken for one of the homeless women on the Bowery. Uh, she dressed in clothes that were donated to the worker and looked fairly nondescript, but there was no mistaking her authority. And to be honest, I was initially pretty terrified. <laughs> Knowing the importance of first impressions, I had spent a lot of time preparing to ask just the, the perfect opening question to make an impression on her. But when the moment came, I was kind of frozen there and blurted out, how do you reconcile Catholicism and anarchism? And she just kind of looked at me with her bemused expression and said, it's never been a problem for me. <laughs> I lacked a follow-up question <laughs> and had no choice but to withdraw and, and ponder that answer for a while, wondering if there was some deeper Zen meaning over time, I came to realize that Dorothy w wasn't particularly interested in abstractions. She was, however, a very sociable and approachable person, and it wasn't very hard to get to know her. She was a wonderful storyteller, and she could spin fascinating tales about the Catholic worker, her comrades in the radical struggle, or poignant details from biographies about Chekhov or Tolstoy or St. Therese. And she was, in turn, endlessly fascinated by other people's stories, where they came from, what books they liked, where they had traveled. What's your favorite novel by Dostoevsky was a typical conversation opener for Dorothy. And whether you said The Brothers Karamazov or The Idiot or Crime and Punishment, she would say, you're absolutely right. <laughs> a few months after my arrival, Dorothy asked me to become the managing editor of the paper. She was, as she liked to say, in retirement and the day-to-day -day management of the paper and the household were in the hands of those she called the young people. At 20, I certainly qualified as young. I wasn't actually a Catholic at that point, and my selection really had evidently nothing to do with any qualifications so much as the, 
fact that no one else was interested in the job. <laughs> Dorothy liked some articles I'd written about Gandhi, and she had uh, such faith in people, and she was able to make them feel her faith as well. Uh, she really had an uncanny ability to discern and encourage people's hidden gifts and talents. I couldn't, of course, imagine at that time that she was pointing me in the direction of my life's work and vocation. She was fastidious and cultivated in her tastes. She loved classical music, the opera, literature, flowers, beautiful things. I remember how she covered the walls of her room in Mary House with postcards, icons, and paintings, but also scenes of nature, forests, oceans, icebergs. One time when I was in jail, she sent me one of these postcards, which was an aerial shot of Cape Cod with the inscription on the back, <clears throat> I hope this card refreshes you and does not tantalize you. She loved to quote the words of Dostoevsky, the world will be saved by beauty. And for all her sadness and the suffering around her, she always had an eye for the transcendent. There were always moments when it was possible to see beneath the surface of things. She would say, look at that tree, and you would you know, kind of notice it. Or it might be some act of kindness or an opera on the radio or just the vines climbing on the fire escape in the, in the middle of a slum. Things like that made her rejoice. I remember so many of her qualities, her courage, her humor, her boundless curiosity, her capacity for indignation, her fascination with detail, the personal and particular over abstract concepts, her effervescent laughter. But if there's any quality I particularly associate with Dorothy, it is gratitude. Such gratitude and happiness at the birth of her daughter that first turned her heart to God. No human creature could receive or contain so vast a flood of joy and love as I often felt after the birth of my child, she wrote. With this came the need to worship, to adore. It was this gratefulness that led to her decision to have her child baptized and to follow by joining the Catholic Church, even though this entailed great personal sacrifice. Appropriately, the words on her gravestone are Deo gratias. But her gratefulness and love for the church did not remove her apprehension of its sins and failures. The church is the, Christ on, is the cross on which Christ is crucified, she liked to ro quote Romano Guardini. She constantly judged the church by the Im of, image of its founder. But when she referred to the failings of the church, she never failed to include herself, praying for forgiveness and a spirit of conversion. I've spent the past several years editing her personal writings, including her diaries, The Duty of Delight, and just recently, All the Way to Heaven, her selected letters published this month. The phrase, The Duty of Delight, was a favorite of Dorothy's. She used it in the last page of her autobiography, The Long Loneliness. It was, she'd found it in a letter by the English critic John Ruskin, whatever he meant by it. It recurs throughout her diaries so often that it's almost a kind of mantra. Often after a recital of drudgery or disappointment, it was a reminder to find God in all things, the sorrows of daily life, and the moments of joy, both of which she experienced in abundance. In the Annals of the Saints, Dorothy's diaries offer something fairly unusual, an opportunity to follow almost day by day in the footsteps of a holy person. Through these writings, we trace the movements of her spirit and her quest for God. We see her praying for wisdom and courage and meeting the challenges of the day. But we also join her as she watches television, devours mystery novels, goes to the movies, plays with her grandchildren, listens to the opera. As familiar as I thought I was with Dorothy's life and writings, working with both her diaries and her letters revealed dimensions of her humanity that sometimes came as a revelation. In her letters, the most astonishing discovery were the three dozen letters to Forster Batterham, the father of her daughter, the man she liked to call her common-law husband. These letters date from the beginning of their romance in 1925 until the eve of her meeting with Peter Morin in 1932. These letters, filled with passion and even erotic energy, reflect the depth of her love for Forster. I think of you much and dream of you every night, she writes him. And if my dreams could affect you over long distance, I'm sure they would keep you awake. The new issue of America Magazine has a cover story that I, I wrote called Dorothy Day in Love. 
and uh, it focuses on these letters, but also on their website they include a, a selection of, of, of some of these. And another point she says, my desire for you is a painful rather than pleasurable emotion. It is a ravishing hunger which makes me want you more than anything in the world and makes me feel as though I could barely exist until I saw you again. When she felt compelled to become a Catholic and forced to refuse to get married, she separated from him. In The Long Loneliness, she says it was literally a choice between God and man, but as the letters demonstrate, the break wasn't nearly as clear-cut as that. For five years, she desperately hoped and prayed that Forster would change his mind and consent to marry her. So deep was her attachment to him, her physical attachment to him, that she felt she had to flee New York, moving with Tamar to California, then Mexico and Florida to resist the temptation to be with him. Do I have to be condemned to celibacy all my days just because of your pig-headedness, she wrote. <laughs> the letters sometimes have an almost unbearable pathos. I dream of you every night, that I'm lying in your arms, and I can feel your kisses, and it is torture to me, but so sweet, too. I do love you more than anything in the world, but I cannot help my religious sense which is torture to me unless I do, I do as I believe right. Or the ache in my heart is intolerable at times, and sometimes for days I can feel your lips upon me, waking and sleeping. It's because I love you, love you so much that I want you to marry me. I want to be in your arms every night as I used to be, and be with you always. But in the end, she realized that this was not to be. It was at this point, this very month, at this point of final resignation that she met Peter Morin, the very same month. It's as if one door closed and another opened on the rest of her life and her lifelong vocation. It was extraordinary to realize on the one hand how much this vocation depended on Forster's commitment to his own principles. If it had been up to Dorothy, she would have married Forster, raised a handful of children, and continued writing novels and plays. There would have been no Catholic worker Surely God works in mysterious ways. At the same time, the story dramatizes the deep sacrifice that lay at the basis of Dorothy's vocation. It was the foundation for a lifetime of courage, perseverance, and dedication. It marked her deep sense of the heroic demands of faith. It also accounted for the high standards to which she held her friends and associates. To a former CW editor, after learning that he planned to remarry without seeking an annulment, she advised him to resign as secretary of a Catholic peace organization. You are certainly going through the sorrowful mysteries, but if you don't go through them to the glorious, you will be a hollow man and considered an opportunist and a fraud. I am putting it as strong as I am able and hate doing it, but to me the faith is the strongest thing in my life, and I can never be grateful enough for the joy I've had for the gift of my faith, my Catholicism. At the same time, Dorothy's letters to Forster amplify the point she made in her autobiography, that there was no contradiction in her mind between merely human love and higher religious aspirations. She says that while her radical friends insinuated that her turn to God was because she was, quote, tired of sex, satiated and disillusioned, her true feelings were quite different. It was because through a whole love, both physical and spiritual, I came to know God. Dorothy Day was a witness or participant in many of the great social and ecclesial movements of her day but her diaries are a reminder that most of life is occupied with ordinary activities and pursuits. Inspired by her favorite saint, Therese of Lisieux, Dorothy was convinced that ordinary life was actually the true arena for holiness. Her spirituality was focused on the effort to practice forgiveness, charity, and patience with those closest at hand. Here the title, The Duty of Delight, really summarizes her approach to life. She believed that delight, like love, is a matter of discipline, a matter of the will. It's one thing to feel delight when things are delightful. It's one thing to love people who are lovable. But the heart of the gospel is adding love, even when there is no love. Loving the person beside you, even if that person is disagreeable. If you will to love someone, if you will to see Christ in them, you can do it. That's what she believed. That didn't mean it was any easier for Dorothy than for the rest of us. But it was the exercise of charity in these small ways that equipped her 
for the extraordinary and heroic action she performed on a wider stage. Like most holy people, she often fell short of her ideals. We know this because she, calls her, her, she herself calls attention to her faults, her impatience, her capacity for anger and self-righteousness. Thinking gloomily of the sins and shortcomings of others, she writes, it suddenly came to me to remember my own offenses, just as heinous as those of others. If I concern myself with my own sins and lament them, if I remember my own failures and lapses, I will not be resentful of others. This was most cheering and lifted the load of gloom from my mind. It makes one unhappy to judge people and happy to love them. I remember hearing a story about how one time someone told Dorothy to hold her temper and she said, I hold more temper in one minute than you do in your entire life. <laughs> in her diary she writes, I have a hard enough job to curb the anger in my own heart which I sometimes even wake up with, go to sleep with, a giant to strive with, an ugliness, a sorrow to me, a mighty struggle to love. As long as there is any resentment, bitterness, lack of love in my own heart, I am powerless. God must help me. The diaries offer a frank and candid picture of the strain and stress of Catholic worker life, the overwhelming demands on Dorothy's time and attention, the rebukes and resentments she faced from those in her own community, the demands of leadership. As she wrote, she found herself in the position of a dictator trying to legislate himself out of existence. I fail people daily, she wrote, God help me, when they come to me for aid and sympathy. There are too many of them, whichever way I turn. It's not that I can do anything. I must always disappoint them and arouse their bitterness, especially when it is material things they want. But I deny them the Christ in me when I do not show them tenderness, love, God forgive me, and make up to them for it. Often she refers to her temptation to simply walk away from the Catholic worker. The opposition to the work, the idea that I did not understand or interpret Peter Morin correctly, there has been many an occasion when I never wanted to see a CW again. But then she adds, some such thought as that of St. John of the Cross would come. Where there is no love, put love and you will find love and makes everything all right. When it comes down to it, even on the natural plane, it is much happier and more enlivening to love than to be loved. She reacted strongly against the loose sexual mores of the 1960s counterculture and resisted their intrusion at the worker. In one letter, she writes of her efforts to purge the worker of a group of beats who, quote, reversed all standards, turning night into day, and proudly proclaimed their freedom from bourgeois morality. This is not reverence for life. It is a great denial and is more resembling nihilism than the revolution which they think they are furthering. At the same time, the memory of her own youthful struggles made her particularly sensitive to the searching and sufferings of youth. To a young woman in distress, she wrote, Please forgive me for presuming to write you so personally, to intrude on you in your suffering as I'm doing, but I felt I had to, because I have gone through so much the same suffering as you in the confusion of my youth and my search for love. It is a very real agony of our own, wanting human love, fulfillment, and one so easily sees all the imperfections of this love we seek, the inability of others ever to satisfy this need of ours, the constant failure of those nearest and dearest to understand, to respond. She entitled the story of her conversion, The Long Loneliness. Despite her life and community, a certain loneliness remained a constant feature of her life. She writes on one a hard occasion, I've had this completely alone feeling, a time when the memory and understanding fail one completely and only the will remains, so that I feel hard and rigid and at the same time ready to sit like a soft fool and weep my eyes out. In response to the insecurity, the sorrows, the drudgery of life among the insulted and injured, she tried to remember always the duty of delight. I was thinking how, as one gets older, we are tempted to sadness, knowing life as it is here on earth, the suffering, the cross, and how we must overcome it daily, growing in love and the joy which goes with loving. And through her diaries and letters, we see her gradually slowing down, adjusting after a heart attack to the end of her restless travels. She had traveled the world. She had spent much of her life, it seems, on an endless bus trip from one end of the country to the other. First she was confined to the city, then to Mary House, 
and finally to her room on the second floor where she spent much of her time gazing out the window on life outside on East 3rd Street, which the Catholic worker shared with the Hells Angels. In her youth, she writes, she had received a great revelation that for anyone attuned to the life of the mind, the future held the promise of unending fascination. And now she could observe, no matter how old I get, no matter how feeble, short of breath, incapable of walking more than a few blocks, what with heart murmurs, heart failure, emphysema perhaps, arthritis in feet and knees, with all these symptoms of age and decrepitude, my heart can still leap for joy as I read and suddenly assent to some great truth enunciated by some great mind and heart. That intense interest in life continued as she took in the world around her and rummaged increasingly what she called the rag bag of memory. She had always been a compulsive writer. Quote, ever since I was eight years old when I wrote a serial story on a little pad of pink paper for my younger sister's entertainment. And writing was virtually the last thing to go. Toward the end, her newspaper columns reverted to short, breathless excerpts from her diary. Just enough, she said, to let people know I am still alive. She kept writing until a few days before her death on November 29, 1980. It is surprising when we look back over our lives to see that the truly significant moments are relatively few. Often we don't recognize them at all except in retrospect as we look back over the paths that they illuminated. Dorothy died almost 30 years ago, and yet it seems to me like no time at all. So much has her memory dominated my life since then. It seems only yesterday we were sitting in her room at Mary House sharing thoughts about Dostoevsky and Gandhi and listening to her stories about Eugene O'Neill and Jack Reed. She was soaked in memories, and yet her spirit of adventure, her idealism, her instinct for the heroic always connect her in my mind with the spirit of youth. Though she grew old and bent with age, she never acquired the spirit of compromise or moral laxity that is a proverbial mark of growing up. Until the end, she was surrounded by young people, and they've continued in large numbers to be drawn to her story and inspired to take up her mission. When I met Dorothy many years ago, I didn't realize this would be the crucial turning point in my life. When she asked me to become editor of the paper, I didn't know that she was showing me my vocation, the work that would occupy me in one way or another for all these decades. I began editing her selected writings months after her death. And 30 years later, I've just published the second volume of her personal papers. Evidently, it was not my vocation to cook soup at the Catholic Worker, but apparently it was my vocation to edit Dorothy's writings and to bear witness to her spirit as I expect and hope to do for the rest of my life. More than 10 years ago, I gave a talk on the centenary of Dorothy's birth and used the, the occasion to lay out the case for her canonization highlighting what I saw as her primary gifts to the church, her synthesis of charity and justice, her vindication of gospel nonviolence, her role in advancing the lay apostolate, her explication of the social implications of the incarnation. Obviously, there's so many other gifts. Now that cause has been endorsed by the church, a long, laborious process that may result one day in her being officially named St. Dorothy, Whatever opinion Dorothy might have had of such a process, you can be sure she would have objected to any effort to airbrush her faults and failings, to put her on a pedestal out of reach of the rest of us, to make her seem unapproachable, otherworldly, and mysterious. For me, the fundamental significance of this cause rests not just in Dorothy's own example of holiness, but in the way she held up the vocation of holiness as the common calling for all Christians. She did not believe holiness was just for a few or for those dedicated to formal religious life. It was simply a matter of taking our baptismal vows seriously, to grow constantly in our capacity for love through the exercise of mercy, compassion, and forgiveness, to put off the old person and put on Christ. She lived out her vocation in the Catholic worker movement, but she set an example for all Christians, especially lay people, I think, reminding us that the gospel is meant to be lived and challenging us to find our own unique way of living out and bearing witness to it in our daily lives. She was a great believer in what she called the sacrament of the present moment. In each situation, 
In each encounter, in each task before us, she believed there is a path to God. We don't need to be in a monastery or a chapel. We don't need to become a different person first. We could start today, this moment, where we are, to add to the balance of love in the world, to add to the balance of peace. Thank you very much. So Robert has agreed to take uh, questions. Uh, you'll notice on either side of the room here, we have microphones. <clears throat> if you have a question, would you please make your way to the microphone and speak uh, into it? And uh, if you would, make sure that what you have to say is a question, if you don't mind. <laughs> and not an answer. And not an answer. <laughs> I think you're willing to take uh, questions of all yeah. sorts about your own personal experience working with, with uh, Dorothy. And questions and of all sorts. All sorts. Could you speak a little bit about uh, Dorothy Day and also her relationship with Thomas Merton, Catherine dehuick Doherty, and the dynamic of those persons in that time? Most of you are probably familiar with, with both Merton and, and Catherine dehuick Doherty, who lived here in Canada. Uh, Catherine and, and, and Dorothy, in some ways, had parallel vocations. Catherine, a Russian immigrant who also underwent a great conversion that awakened her to the social challenge of the gospel and dedicated her life to the poor and to uh, spreading that message here in, in, in Toronto. And then she went to Harlem in New York, uh, in the same city at the same time with Dorothy in the 40s, uh, with a friendship house there, and then moved back uh, to Canada. One of the very first letters in the uh, collection of, of writings here, the letters, is a letter to, to Catherine who had uh, just discovered the Catholic worker and wanted to know more about it. And they, they quickly became uh, friends and comrades. Uh, in fact, there's a book of their, just their writings that has been published, I think called Comrades Stumbling Along or something like that. It's a line from one of Catherine's letters. Uh, they saw each other as kind of sisters. But uh, they got along better at a, at a distance. Um, <laughs> they were very temperamentally very different. Catherine, uh, a baroness by marriage, was a large and dramatic kind of a person. And Dorothy was actually very shy, uh, didn't like public speaking, and was very kind of plain spoken in her delivery. Uh, Catherine was a great uh, storyteller and kind of spellbinding speaker, very inspiring. Uh, Thomas Merton, uh, whom you also mentioned was a connection in there, in his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, he writes about hearing Catherine de Hewick speak at the college where he was teaching, and he was so inspired that he went down to Harlem and, and worked with her for some years before he became a Trappist. Uh, he was very challenged by her idea that it was the failure of Christians to live out the gospel uh, that accounted for the attraction of communism, and success of communism. So both Dorothy and Catherine had this uh, you know, s similar vision in a lot of ways, but uh, Catherine objected. She came to the worker and visited, and she was appalled by how disorderly and dirty it was. And she lectured Dorothy about this and how you know, God loves clean cleanliness, she said, and how can you allow all this mess? And uh, so that, uh, Dorothy saw right away that they, you know, that they had a different way of, of, of doing things. Uh, Dorothy became irritated when she heard the story constantly come back to her. Dor Catherine, often in telling stories, would, would praise Dorothy her holiness, and would say, one time I stayed with her, and she invited a syphilitic woman in to share her bed with her, and she was covered with sores and oozing, and, uh, and I said, Dorothy, this is, you must have more prudence, and she said to me, Catherine, you must have more faith, and Dorothy said, said nothing like that has ever happened, uh, please stop repeating that story, I've, I'm not crazy, uh, I would not have a leprous person in bed with me and if you keep repeating that the health department's going to shut us down <laughs> um, so uh, Catherine you know moved, went back to Canada and maybe New York was was too small for the, for the two of them but they remained uh, they remained friends uh, you know to, to the end of Dorothy's life uh, Thomas Merton and Dorothy never met uh, but they corresponded quite avidly and he began contributing articles to the Catholic worker uh, in the early 1960s when he was beginning to uh, speak out on issues of peace and racism and social justice, particularly nuclear war during the Cold War. And uh, the Catholic worker became a favorite outlet for him. 
in publishing some of these articles until he was uh, ordered by his censors in his order to stop writing on what they thought were unmonastic topics like that. So there's a lot of correspondence between them. Their letters are very different. Dorothy writes like just an ordinary person, and Thomas Merton writes for an audience, uh, and, and his letters are publishable, you know, kind of works of literature and, and kind of essays. Uh, one of the things that was interesting was Dorothy, it reveals something about herself, I think, how often in her letters to them, to him, she prays for perse his perseverance in his vocation. I think there were a lot of rumors going around that, that Merton was going to leave the monastery, uh, and she was very troubled by that. Uh, she thought that would be a terrible thing. And uh, she often says, you know, I have to pray myself for perseverance. Uh, it, was, it was something that, that was a real commitment uh, for her to decide year after year to stick with what she was doing. And it was, uh, even after he died, she, she, she wrote a letter. Uh, her column was just sort of quoting from his letters to prove, dispel any rumors that he was going to leave the monastery. There was kind of a, a low point or a, a bump in their relationship in 1965 when a young man at the, at the Catholic worker named Roger Laporte, young volunteer there, without telling anybody, uh, poured gasoline over himself and immolated himself in front of the U UN as a protest against the Vietnam War. It was a shocking uh, thing and uh, Dorothy didn't really even know the young man, but every, a lot of people, you know, the media and the press were kind of accusing her of, of inciting the suicide, as they called it. Uh, and Merton himself was so disturbed by this, he thought the whole, you know, locked away in his hermitage there, he just thought the, the world, is, the peace movement itself is going crazy. And immediately sent off a letter uh, telling Dorothy and he wanted to remove his name as a sponsor of the Catholic Peace Fellowship and uh, saying, please don't encourage anybody else to do things like this. And Dorothy was very, very uh, hurt by that, very stung because she was getting criticism from so many sides and to have Merton also seeming to blame her was very painful for her. He, he later apologized, relented, and, uh, but she, she never exactly felt the same way about him. And uh, years, you know, decades later, any time I would mention Thomas Merton, she would kind of bristle a little bit and remember this, this episode was still a very, very, uh, you know, present uh, wound to him. But, but certainly, you know, Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, you know, Daniel Berrigan, uh, that, that era in the 60s when, when the kind of Catholic uh, peace voice and resistance to the kind of logic of the Cold War and everything uh, began to, to, to come together, uh, it was, they were, they was uh, you know, it was an extremely important relationship. I'll take an opportunity to ask a question, Robert. Um, one of the, the themes that is clear uh, based on your presentation and, and her writings is that uh, this, this uh, sort of slur that she was a communist mm -hmm. um, oftentimes had uh, some sort of facts that were attached to it, b partly because of some of the friends that she kept. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm thinking in particular here, uh, people like uh, Cesar, Cesar Chavez, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some of the movements that she was associated with. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, the friends that she ran with that were associated with unions and, and the, these communists and what that meant to her? Um, she, her, her first memoir was called From Union Square to Rome. Uh, it was kind of a little sensationalistic, but it did, it did, uh, it was before she wrote The Long Loneliness, and it really was, she was talking about the influences, things that had led her to Catholicism. And in, in that book, she focused particularly on her involvement in the uh, kind of radical social movements. Uh, she worked on a newspaper called The Call, a socialist paper. And then she was on a journal called The Masses that was suppressed by the government, it's edited by Max Eastman, and had writers like Jack Reed, who wrote, you know, Ten, Year, Ten Days That Shook the World. Uh, she was, uh, she herself was very drawn more to the IWW, the International Industrial Workers of the World, and their kind of uh, anarcho-syndicalist kind of movement. She you know, was arrested as a suffragist, but she never voted in her life. Um, and uh, that was the kind of you know, environment that she was uh, you know, moving in at, at that time. One of her closest friends, you might even say her, her, her boyfriend, was a guy named, uh, uh, you know, now what am I, what's the matter with me? Mike Gold. Uh, who then be was, became a, one of the founders of the American Communist Party and editor of the Daily Worker uh, for years. And she, she remained um, 
uh, friendly with him until he uh, died. She considered him, she called him you know, one of my oldest friends. Um, during the 1950s in the McCarthy era when uh, you know, people were all very, very you know, careful to uh, uh, you know, show that they had no communist associations, uh, she, she made no apology uh, for her uh, friendship with, with, with people in, in the left. In one of the early letters, in the, in the, she writes to a journal called the Interracial Review, and apparently was in the 1930s, responding they were criticizing uh, the uh, communists and f accusing them of being sort of opportunistic in their, uh, their commitment to racial justice. And she said, uh, why should we blame them for being opportunistic? They're on the right side on this, this issue. Uh, if we think we can do better, we, we, let us do it instead of just criticizing them. Um, so, you know, she was, she was never, she, she never considered, she was never a member of the Communist Party, never, never considered herself a communist. But it's funny that, that this keeps, it continues to come up even today. Do you know who Glenn, Glenn Beck is and does his reputation extend across the border here? He's a uh, Fox News in, in America, uh, in the kind of demagogue, um, who, um, I, d I did a column for I write a publisher's letter, and I, I said the other day it's it's usually considered you know paranoid when you think that that there's secret messages addressed to you in the radio and television and that sort of thing. But I can't help but thinking that or that Glenn Beck is obsessed with Orbis books, and I, I went through this, this these crusades he goes on. One was about how social justice is a is a code word for for Marxism, and how if you're in a church where they use the word social justice, you should quit that church. And then he talked about you know Jim Wallace of Sojourners is supposedly Obama's, you know, right-hand, you know, religious advisor and, 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 and communist. And then he had a thing about my author, James Cohn, the black theologian, because he thought he was the one who inspired Obama's minister, Alex, you know, uh, Reverend Wright, who then was a communist. And anyway, all these things, you know, then he went on about liberation theology, how Obama is really a liberation theologian, and that's the source of, because of, he'd, he'd, he'd said a year, you know, a year or so ago that Obama was a racist who had deep-seated hatred for white people and white culture. And he later said, well, I don't really mean he's not, he's not, maybe that's not right, putting it right. It's his theology, that, his liberation theology. So I went through all these things and re referenced all the Orbis books that they seem to refer to. But my favorite was when he referred to Dorothy Day as a, he said, I don't really know much about her. Apparently she's a notorious communist. <laughs> and so I wrote a, um, a little rejoinder you know, to that. Uh, you know, quoting you know, a, lot, a lot of people, not the first person to say that, J. Edgar Hoover, that said she was consciously or unconsciously used by communists. Uh, but, um, you know, Dom Helder Camera, you know, said, when I, when, I feed the poor, when, I, when I feed the hungry, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor are hungry, then they call me a, a communist. You know, and that, I, I said, you know, Dorothy's no communist. If, if Glenn Beck knew what she really was, it doesn't mean he would like her any, anymore. He might like her even less. Uh, but the, you know, either Dorothy would wouldn't wouldn't care; she wouldn't mind. You mentioned Cesar Chavez, of course, not 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 a communist in any any sense. The, for the founder of the United Farm Workers, uh, was one of her her. She had a real crush on Cesar Chavez. He was like her total hero. Here's this this uh, poor farm worker leading this union. He was very deeply Catholic. Uh, had a you know, picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe on his wall and say the Rosary and Mass every day, and and uh, very religious the way he brought together his struggle for social justice, his, his nonviolence. Dorothy's last arrest was with the farm workers in 1973 when she was 75. Yes? Can you tell us, can you tell us more about Forrester and whether she maintains some sort of sense of his life as she uh, progressed in hers? And also her daughter, has she followed in her mother's footstep? In uh, no, her, no, her daughter died uh, just a couple years ago. As for Forrester, they didn't have much contact for, for some years. Uh, of course, he stayed in touch with Tamar, and that was a connection uh, between them. Uh, in the 1940s, 50s, there's an occasional reference in the diaries that she saw him somewhere or other. An interesting thing happened. This was, uh, she had told me about this, but she never, she never wrote about it at all. In end of 1959, Forster had been living with another woman named Nanette for, for many years, almost since she, he split up with Dorothy. And she, got, she gets a call saying that Nanette is dying of cancer. Uh, and the, the you know, 
crazy custom of the day. They didn't, the doctor said, don't tell her, you know, that she's dying. Uh, and so she didn't know what this matter with her, but she, she was very, very sick and asked if Dorothy would come and take care of her. Dorothy who takes care of so many other people. And they were living on Staten Island. Dorothy had, had a farm community out there at the time. She, so she dropped everything and spent several months uh, taking care of Nanette and nursing her uh, and kind of, you know, helping to run the household. And, uh, and while meanwhile, Forster was crying and sobbing about the cruelty of life and everything like that, and Dorothy was just taking care of things. And, uh, and actually, Nanette asked her to baptize her the day before she died. Um, and she said, she, to- she told me in telling this story, and then the, the next day, Forster seemed to, to imagine that I was just going to move back into the house with him and carry on like this. And I said, are you crazy? Whatever. You see, she, you know, she moved out, but it was a... They, it kind of re- renewed their friendship, and uh, in later years, you know, she would write him again, started writing letters again, telling him about all of their progeny, all of the all of the nine, you know, grandchildren and then great grandchildren, and he would visit her in the hospital, and she would visit him in the hospital and exchange gifts, and toward the end of her life, you know, she said he was calling her every day. Uh, Tamara told me that that Forster always took great pride in Dorothy's fame and achievements and kept a a scrapbook with every article uh, clipped out about her. Uh, He attended her uh, funeral and was uh, present at St. Patrick's Cathedral uh, for a memorial service the year after she died. Um, As for Tamar, uh, she married very young on her 18th birthday to a man 17 years older than, than she uh, who had a lot of trouble, it turns out, was, I mean, was alcoholic and probably bipolar, and, and it was a very, very hard life. Dorothy w- was uh, not at all happy about this alliance, and earlier had done everything she could to try to keep them apart, but ultimately felt that she had to, to respect Tamar's decision when she was 18 to get married. The, the, the letters uh, particularly, the diaries to some extent, but the letters particularly show another kind of dimension of Dorothy's humanity and her struggles as a mother between uh, letting go and the impulse to control. Um, and it was, uh, she loved uh, Tamar hugely, but you can feel that the difficulty of being a mother in the midst of leading a movement like this, a single mother. Uh, Tamar spent a lot of time in boarding schools and and, uh, and then uh, uh, you know, went into kind of farming life when she got married, had nine children, and uh, they lived in quite a lot of, you know, difficult poverty. Uh, but another thing that came through to me was kind of a revelation reading the diaries, was to realize how involved Dorothy remained in their in their lives. She spent, I mean, I knew in the, in the newspaper she was always saying, went to visit Tamar and everything, the children, and, but I didn't realize how much of the time she, she was there. Uh, in the early 1960s, um, eventually Tamar and her husband separated. He, he kind of totally cracked up. And uh, she went to, uh, did a practic- degree in practical nursing. And Dorothy moved into the house for uh, four months uh, to take care of all the children. And so, you know, we think of Dorothy all, you know, picket lines and soup kitchens and jail and all that kind of thing. But to see how much of her life was spent in thing, ways that, you know, we, any of us can identify with and are talking about uh, the chaos and the noise and of, of, of all these teenagers and their rock and roll and their crazy, you know, hours and, and driving them to football practice and to dentist appointments and helping them with their homework and all that kind of thing. And her pain at the fact that none of them really followed her in, in, the, in her faith. Um, so she, she always resented it when people thought that she, you know, didn't, you know, the things she was talking about uh, were fine for her, but you know, she, if she were in a family, she, would, she wouldn't be able to live like this. And she always felt, I, I have a family. You know, I have, had, have a daughter. I have grandchildren and everything. And they were a very big part of her life. Tamar uh, Dai was a very shy, quiet person. She was not an activist or anything. And she uh, devoted herself to kind of crafts and raising a family. And she loved kind of nature and beautiful things, weaving. Uh, and she died uh, just before the, uh, the diaries were published. Um, Um, you spoke about um, Dorothy Day's um, response to the, the, the changes in culture in the 1960s. Uh, um, could you speak a little bit about her response to the Second Vatican Council, mm-hmm. um, to the work of the Council, how, how she received the Council? 
mm -hmm. and to the changes that she observed in the church, especially in the 1970s and mm -hmm. into, into the 80s uh, before she died? Uh, yes. Um, Dorothy um, loved uh, Pope John the Twenty Third. Um, she went on a pilgrimage for peace with women there in 1963, and was and was delighted then when he issued Pacem and Terrace, and she 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 uh, was uh, very excited about that, and very excited about the whole spirit of of the Council and the reform and renewal in the Church. She went again to the, to the council in 1965 as part of a group of women who were fasting for 10 days uh, to try to, to uh, uh, praying for the council fathers to, to issue a strong statement on the subject of nuclear war. And again, she felt very rewarded. Uh, there was a kind of a peace lobby there and they, they, they printed up a, a special issue of the Catholic Worker which they distributed to every member, every uh, council father. Uh, with articles about, about peace and nonviolence, and then when when in Gaudium et Spes, you know, said that any act of indiscriminate, you know, destruction aimed at whole cities and populations is a is a, a crime against God that is you know unreservedly condemned. Uh, she th thought that was a, a you know great great thing. Now, you know, I say that Dorothy was you know traditional, you know, kind of Catholic in a lot of ways, um, but she in so many ways anticipated. Uh, the you know the, the the spirit of of the council, and she was very involved from the 1930s in the liturgical movement, uh, very uh, close to uh, Virgil Michel, and the monks in, at, at St. John's who were promoting uh, liturgical reform, which they felt was connected to social reform, and uh, people being more involved in the liturgy uh, meant they would also understand more about how to apply faith to to social life. She was very involved with the Catholic you know family movement. Uh, farming and other kind of movements toward community, but she was she was uh, very uh, in favor of you know the vernacularization of the liturgy, she uh, the role of the laity, uh, ecumenism, uh, her uh, interest in scripture, and making that more you know making Catholics more literate and, and knowledgeable about the Bible. Uh, she was uh, of course the, you know social justice, but also uh, freedom of conscience. Her her uh, extreme interest in dialogue with uh, Judaism and friendship toward uh, you know, resistance to anti-Semitism. Uh, you can just sort of go through almost you know, the whole list of, of what we kind of associate with Vatican II and say that, you know, that she was all in favor of that. Now, like, like many Catholics of her generation too, she all is a convert. She, she, she was very disturbed by kind of wholesale change and, and what seemed like adaptation of the church to the kind of spirit of of the, the counterculture or the spirit of the kind of rejection of authority in general. She, she had great respect for uh, of, uh, authority. And she uh, did not like to see uh, people uh, uh, you know, walking away from their vows, whether priests or religious, that disturbed her a lot. She didn't like to see priests and religious not in their, in their habits or wearing collars. Mm -hmm. uh, she was very t traditional about that and liked priests to look like a priest and that sort of thing. Um, she, but you know, toward the end of her life, she got interested in the Catholic charismatic uh, renewal, and she began going to or Pentecostalism, as she called it. And she would, you know, go to charismatic prayer meetings. She liked that 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 a lot. Uh, and she um, um, uh, she was not a you know a, a kind of a just a angry uh, you know uh, grumpy person or something like that. She she found it difficult to adjust to some of the new la language and liturgy and that sort of thing. But basically, she felt that. That uh, Vatican II had uh, had uh, made lay Catholics feel much more central and a part of the Church, and, and awakened them to to their to their you know the vocation in the deepest sense. So um, uh, you know all of that. I think I think that you know um, I think in a lot of ways Dorothy Day you know was in some ways in this very much in sync with the kind of mentality of John Paul II or something in his. His views on sexuality and his views on on labor and work and, and social justice, as well as uh, you know the traditional aspects of his theology, with a little dash of anarchism thrown in. <laughs> <laughs> she was close, of course, you know, to Mother Teresa of Calcutta. She she visited uh, Mother Teresa in Calcutta, uh, 
and who pinned on her a, uh, a cross of the Missionaries of Charity, kind of made her an honorary member of the Missionaries of Charity. Uh, Mother Teresa came to, to visit her at, at Mary House uh, just soon before she died. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. Okay. I'm going to ask you to extrapolate on uh, something you, you said in regard to um, sort of moral theology and experience. I mean, it, it's, it's, it would seem obvious that so much of who we know about Dorothy Day, um, you know, it, it's in sorrow, it's in loneliness, it's in those themes that we, we keep coming back to, her experiences of working with the poor, the destitute, the naked, and so on. And for many uh, Catholics, um, not just moral theologians, but the lady as well. Um, is she a model for um, Catholics struggling to uh, sort of wed their experiences of dealing with the poor and uh, dealing with those people who are living on the margins and then taking those experiences and making sense of the faith at the same time? So, in other words, doing a kind of almost theology from below, experiencing uh, the truth that's in an experience, and then somehow interpreting Catholic teaching in light of those experiences. Do you think she's a good model for that, that way of thinking? I think that, that um, one of the what made Dorothy Day so exceptional in a way, uh, first of all, she, she you know, set out to live out her faith in a very concrete uh, fashion, very heroic uh, way, but not in a, in a churchy kind of way, uh, but in a way that, that was really based on her just plain reading of the New Testament. Um, there's something you know, the ingredients of her life that made her up, her kind of very American Protestant sort of upbringing, her experience in the radical movement, uh, her reading of Dostoevsky and, and, and that, that res resonated so much with her f feeling about the mystery of, of, of the poor and of suffering and of how we find Christ in, through, through uh, in mercy, through, through experience of suffering, things like that. That uh, she all brought with her into the, to, to the church is it was it a you know an advantage somehow that she did not have a parochial school uh, upbringing where someone like that might have been just channeled into becoming a nun. Um, she uh, she kind of you know she was her vocation was it came arose in this kind of spontaneous uh, original way of just responding to to social needs the needs of, of, of people right there. I mean, it started with a newspaper, and they were talking about how every parish should have a hospitality house and everything, and so when people began coming to the door and saying, well, where are these hospitality houses you're talking about? And so she just rented an apartment and began taking people in. Uh, had no money for this, the money just came. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, is that a, um, uh, long before there was any, you know, the, we talk of an, an option for the poor or something like that in, in, in Catholic uh, theology in recent times, she just instinctively picked up this message that, that Jesus addressed his message, first of all, as good news to the poor, uh, and that Christians had uh, an obligation to make that credible uh, by living that out. If it was good news to the poor, what could that mean if it does not mean justice and it does not mean food and no shelter and companionship and community, especially in the, in the face of the depression and all that kind of thing. I'm always interested in, in, in people like that who, who have this instinctive uh, sense of, of what Catholic morality represents that's not, uh, that's, that's, that does not exactly what would be you know, necessarily preached from the pulpit of the time or in a, in a manual, a confessor's manual. You know, if you compare someone like, you know, Dorothy Day, then, you know, let's say, you know, Oskar Schindler or something like that in, 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 in Poland in World War II, who, who you know, by, you know, nine out of ten, uh, you know, <laughs> counts a, a confessor would say, here's a really, you know, messed up, bad Catholic who's an adulterer and, and kind of a playboy and gambler and a drinker, and he's a member of... With the, I don't know, member of the Nazi Party, that that count, uh, he has a, a factory that employs slave labor. Would that would that be one of the you know counts for him to confess? 
Uh, but here this complicated guy, not a paragon of morality in any, any traditional Catholic sense, who then risks his life to uh, rescue you know, people who were otherwise you know, defined as refuse, to be burned and disposed of. Uh, and almost you know, risks his life, pours out his fortune, uh, to, uh, racing against to save as many lives as possible. And a, and how do we so a, a kind of a Catholic morality or ethics or something that emerges out of of response to social reality of that kind, even when it's not uh, packaged in some kind of you know. F- formula of respect for life or something like that or the way they, the, you know, the, the, the church uh, presents us to it. And I, I was, this came up last night. I was, I was giving a talk on this, and, and there were a lot of moral theologians in the audience. And it began me uh, thinking of, of you know, your Franz Jägerstadter, another, another example of that era. He was a Catholic layman, a peasant in Austria, who was the only uh, Catholic layperson in Austria who was beheaded, executed for refusing to serve in Hitler's army. Uh, he actually did go to his priest and went to his bishop to ask for moral guidance on this. And they all said, uh, it's your duty to just you know, take care of your family, be a provider, be a father, ser- you know, defend your country. Uh, and the other bigger political questions are not you know, for you. Whereas he, he believed that taking an oath of allegiance to Hitler would, would be a mortal sin. And by his very traditional uh, Catholic upbringing, you know, you, you die with a mortal sin on, on your soul. You, you'll, you'll burn in hell forever. And, uh, and here was a, uh, you know, his bishop, his priest, they, they, didn't, they didn't have the, those, those lenses to, see, to, to, to think in that way. Nobody was even talking about. So he was executed. And, uh, you know, decades, you know, go by. And here, Jägerstadter is, is, is now beatified. By whom? By a pope who, as a young man, took the oath that, that Jägerstadter felt was a sin to, to take. Uh, he was a young, he was a teenager. What, no, it's not. He was not a war criminal or anything like that. But the interesting, the ironies of, of, of history and the idea that there is a, a morality that, that we can you know, find in life and reading in the, through the light of Scripture, the Word of God or something like that, that sometimes will uh, propose uh, action or response from us that is not that you would not necessarily have heard just by going to church, whether, you know, the abolition era, you know, how many, how many Catholic sermons were there on the evils of slavery? Uh, how, how often do you think Catholics heard that from the pulpit on a, on a, on a Sunday? Uh, Quakers were, you know, were among the first to, to, to take up that. Uh, and, you know, whether today, whether it's torture or whether it's the degradation of, of the environment. I, I remember reading, uh, you know, Ignacio Silone wrote the great a radical Italian author who had these kind of deep Catholic sort of sympathies, wrote Bread and Wine, one of Dorothy's favorite novels, and uh, wrote about how, you know, in the 1930s in fascist Italy, you know, what you'd hear in Sunday, every Sunday, was a sermon all about immodest dress and crazy wild, you know, dancing on the weekends and stuff like that, while, while there were, you know, concentration camps and torture and people being executed and war in Abyssinia and all this kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, do I think that, that Dorothy represents a, a model of somebody who, who challenges us to look at the, 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 the challenge, the, the, the realities of our time, let's say global warming or climate change, or, you know, it's one of the most dramatic things, and to say, wait a minute, all these things, all these moral questions that we spend 90% of our time in the church talking about, what are any of them going to mean if, you know, in 50 years we're all uh, going to be, you know, up to our necks in water or, you know, uh, if the earth is unsustainable or something like that? It makes, there, there are kind of issues like that that seem, when you think about it, so that trump anything you could, you could talk about, about bioethics or whether the ethics of stem cell research, all these things are there, valuable, important you know, end-of-life decisions, death panels, and health care reform, or whatever. Uh, there's still, I mean, the point I'm making is things staring us right in the face, I, I would say, that are, are so fantastically urgent and obvious, not you know, as well as the issue of the poor, and as well as the issue of, 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 of violence and poverty and inequality. In the United States, I read the other day, uh, it's now the point where the income of the top 1% of the population exceeds the income of the bottom 90% of the population. 
uh, a, a stratification of, 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 of resources far worse than in the time of the Depression when Dorothy was writing, when you had a handful of plutocrats and stuff like that. And then, and then, you know, then calling for uh, the extension you know, of, of you know, fantastic you know, tax reductions for these, the same 1%. And that. This is in the United States I'm talking about, so I'm not challenging anybody here in this audience. Canada, where you have wonderful health care and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, my, my point being, yeah, that, that, that uh, I think that Dorothy exploded this idea of parochial Catholic moral issues, whether the use of condoms or the use of, you know, the uh, school vouchers or whatever, or, or whatever we you know, think of as, oh, that's, those are Catholic moral issues. And she said Catholic moral issues are the same moral issues that, the, that, that Jesus confronted of, of, of violence and suffering of the poor and sickness and, and people who are discarded and are treated who have no, who are, have no worth and have no, you know, social value and no rights and that sort of thing. And uh, I think that, that, that the revolution in morality, you know, in Catholic morality that she represented by, by shifting, you know, the concern of, of Catholicism for the world that is as big as the world, the joys, the anxieties, the griefs, the sorrows of humanity are the joys, the griefs, the, you know, anxieties of, of the church. There's the first line of Gaudium et Spes and, at Vatican II. And that kind of, I think that, ex you know, to get back to your question, that exactly represented uh, the, the, the spirit of her Catholicism. It included everything. So, thanks, Robert. Uh, to help draw this evening to a close, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. David Perrin to the podium. Dr. Perrin is the president at St. Jerome's University. Thank you very much, uh, Scott, and thank all of you for uh, coming this evening. It's a pleasure to see you here again. Uh, many familiar faces, many people uh, engaged, I see, in various uh, not-for-profits and uh, on the streets and in various uh, types of involvement in, in our Kitchener-Waterloo region. Such a pleasure to uh, see you here tonight, and thank you for coming. Uh, I would also like to say it's such a pleasure uh, tonight to, uh, in partnership with our Catholic school boards, to uh, sponsor this evening with uh, Robert uh, Ellsberg. Uh, we understand that Catholic education is elementary, high school, and post-secondary or university, and uh, we uh, count as fortunate to be able to partner with the Catholic school boards, and thank you also for your support in this area. Robert Ellsberg this evening has helped us understand better a life, Dorothy Day, an example of where smallness goes too big unwittingly and perhaps unexpectedly. Robert has helped us understand the power of the word that grows truth, the word that on a page sits ever so innocently, it sits as a silent witness to the meaning of our lives. But when read, when picked up, the word plunges deep into our hearts and draws up vast quantities of wisdom as we see in the life of Dorothy Day. The lesson here that I believe Robert has helped us understand better this evening is that the initial inconsequential is transformed into profound witness, profound meaning that indeed transforms the world. Such is the life of Dorothy Day. Robert Ellsberg has helped us to understand the capacity for one to transform many. The Catholic worker may be the written word, but that word is more correctly identified with the life, the dynamics of Dorothy herself, the incarnate word. For her holiness is understood in a range of ways, not isolated in the confines of a single dwelling place, but in the trenches of life. A word indeed that has become flesh, and in these trenches in which she lived, she discovered beauty, the aesthetic 
that leads us to the transcendent nature of all of our lives. The transcendence in all of its manifestations, as Robert helped us understand, forgiveness, delight, charity, patience, love, and indeed faith. In this, youth lives eternal in all of us, in these values. Thank you, Robert, for reminding us of the freshness that life can be as we ponder the life of Dorothy Day. Thank you.